Welcome to New Humanum. My guest today is John Pontifex. John is the head of information and press at a charity Aid to the Church in Need, which supports persecuted Christians around the world. John, welcome to New Humanum. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, to start off with, I'd just like to talk to you about your own personal formation as a Christian. Um, tell me, was yours a very Christian background? Did you come from a Christian family? How is it that you ended up where you are? Well, it couldn't be described as more Catholic if it tried, really, um, for the simple reason that I had, uh, I went to uh, a Benedictine-run school, Downside, and uh, I had four uncles who were monks. Um, and one of them was, they were great uncles, and one of them was still very much alive as a monk in the monastery attached to the school where I went. I used to meet him every Saturday. He was in his 90s, and he was a philosopher, and everything that you asked him was always seen through the prism of some philosophical uh, debate. So, you know, you'd say, I don't get on with this particular housemaster or teacher or whatever. And he, he then looked at you, um, squinting slightly, and he would say something like, well, you see, no one sees eye to eye quite with anyone. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it meant that you were constantly asking, found yourself with him asking questions that meant that you could probe deeper into your faith and see it as being uh, addressing wider questions about the meaning of existence and the meaning of your life. As you describe it, it sounds as if you didn't have much choice about being a Catholic. I mean, it was a sort of foregone conclusion. It was. I, I, the story always had it that my dad had put my name down to go to this school practically the day after I was born. So whether that was apocryphal or true, that was certainly how it felt. And I just didn't question it. I myself went to a Catholic school. Uh, my formation was with Christian brothers. And I must say that that was a mixed experience for me. Um, and when I left school, I certainly uh, reacted against that for a while. Did you ever go through a period of doubt or rejection, or was it always clear to you that uh, the Catholic faith was for you? Well, I, I identified with it early on. I felt a, a sense of um, communal spirit, if you like, with, with the monks, partly because my own family were monks. But I think later on... Uh, and indeed, even quite recently, I've had cause to really, uh, really question it, particularly given the, uh, the child abuse scandals, that people who were in charge of us and who we respected and who seemed to have a, a sense of, of what really mattered in life, uh, and they, they themselves were found seriously wanting, and that has made me question afresh uh, what, what really grounds my faith. So I wouldn't say it's sort of middle-aged life crisis, but um, it has made me um, more quizzical, but equally as, as committed. I mean, the abuse scandal has been... I mean, it is a statement of the blindingly obvious, but it has sent shockwaves through the Catholic community worldwide. And um, one only has to look at Ireland, for instance, where there's been such a dropping off in religious observance and belief in the Catholic faith. Um, but I suppose, looking at it objectively, we should not, not be surprised that evil is at work in the church. It's at work everywhere. Unfortunately, human beings are not perfect, and um, there's a real need for individuals, communities, to, to rethink their formation so that they really are able to unpack the darker areas of their consciousness, um, tendencies, weaknesses, uh, that need to be understood more fully. And if they're not understood more fully, then inevitably they're going to come out from the undergrowth, as it were, and wreak havoc. Um, so I think the, the process involves a greater degree of honesty within safe, within safe boundaries. And once that is put in place, I think there's there's a way forward, but the concealment, the, the failure to recognise the uh, the pretense that it doesn't isn't there, is I think an essential cause of, of of the problems that then would then have emerged. Are you optimistic at all? The church is um, moving on from this stage. I mean, do you see any signs yourself that um, there is fresh thinking and a 
a way forward to tackle this um, incipient problem going forward? I mean, do you think that the church has put in place the sort of safeguards which it needs now? Well, I, for example, um, am MC, Master of Ceremonies, at my local church, and the the checks and balances, the DBS checks, the other things that they impose on us uh, are ones that give me great confidence working with young people because not only are they rigorous, not only are there different types of, uh, of DBS and equivalent checks, but they are thoroughgoing and they are regular. And they, they demonstrate that the church is, is changing. The question is, is it changing sufficiently? But my experience from... You know, involvement in the life of the, the, the Catholic community locally is that huge significant steps are being taken and we're much more aware of it. And um, the hope is that, that that culture will be embedded and that there will be a, a, a fully rigorous uh, approach to protecting young people, um, knowing that these risks will never disappear, they will always be that, that possibility. But we don't want to get into a situation where people dare work within the Catholic community for fear of, a, uh, of an accusation, for fear of an unwanted or, or indeed totally uncalled for uh, question to be raised about them. So putting in place these DBS checks and other things um, is, is, I'm sure, part of the way forward. Um, and, you know, we, we need to be committed to that. In the, the national census results, which came out in November... Um, there was this steep drop recorded in the number of people identifying as Christian in the country. So, um, and the UK is, in international comparisons, one of the least religious countries in the world. I think only 10% of the population identify as being um, strongly religious, and that covers all denominations. So you, as a committed Catholic, are very much a, um, in a minority. Does it feel to you, being a Catholic, does that feel countercultural these days, would you say? It does feel countercultural, but the question is, I suppose that underlies that, is, is that in any way intimidating? I think we can change that to, to instead of being intimidating, being an advantage because the secular narrative is so so much a, a, a trodden path and it's so hammered out every time you switch on any form of media that people, I, I, I think, are getting tired of it and they want a different uh, approach. And also uh, they want something that is, is inherently more hope-filled. So um, the, the idea that you can... Uh, place your trust in something that is evidenced by certain things, but not to the full degree that you would expect from science, um, it is something that actually opens up a totally new vista, which I think people, given a chance, would be are interested in. So when you get into discussions with people, uh, they're, they're uh, as attracted by the novelty of the approach as anything else. What, what is your experience of as a Catholic, um, as a Christian, a committed Christian, what is your experience of dealing with young people? I mean, does the message make sense these days? This is a, a good question. I, mean, I was asked uh, by our confirmation group at my local parish uh, to give a talk about Aid to the Church in Need, and this is a group of teenagers, early teenagers, 13, 14, and I was told going into this particular session that this particular group were, were not really very sympathetic and that I would be met by a wall of, of silent resistance. And as I walked in to the, to the room where they were all gathered, I, I, th those fears were, were <laughs> confirmed. You, they looked at you very suspiciously. And I thought, how do I connect with these people? Because my, my mindset, my approach, as soon as I start using classic words of religion, they're going to just switch off completely. So I thought the only way round this 
is to tell the story of somebody their age, who I know from my work with Aid to the Church in Need, who is suffering uh, in a very, very visceral way, and whose suffering would immediately end were they to abandon their faith. And if they were to hear that story about rape, about forced conversion, about forced marriage, and about now having escaped that situation, living uh, in hiding, uh, for being accused of apostasy, that would really make them not only identify with that person, but think completely differently about their whole approach to life, uh, which demonstrates that in real terms, they haven't seen the full data, as it were. If you open them up to a wider vista, it asks them to question the basis on which they're making their decisions. And I was told it was the, one of the best sessions of the entire confirmation program. And they've urgently asked me to come back and do it this time around. So I think personal encounter, personal story, um, and taking people outside the narrow confines of the Western experience it, it is a way to, to re-engage. How do you explain the fact that um, Christian suffering persecution will undergo that persecution in the name of the faith? What is it that, as you say, if on pain of death you're forced with re you're faced with reconversion and you say no, and you choose martyrdom, what is it about the faith? Um, that explains that. I mean, why do people, why do people suffer in the name of the faith? I think people's sense of, of dignity and self-worth is something they're not willing to give away. That if uh, you can take from people their money, you can take from people their other possessions, you can take their home away, you can relocate them. But as all these things are taken away from the individual, um, they begin to realise there's one thing that they, the, the oppressor can't take away, and that is their own dignity. And essential to that dignity is their, their response to deeper questions of meaning in their lives. And um, it, it's, it's often the way that in situations of deep pain and struggle, a person's sense of the dignity of, the, of their belief in God that comes from their belief in God um, grows in their mind and becomes the one thing they're not willing to give up. And I, when I've interviewed people in Pakistan who've been living in safe houses um, and, and been you know, threatened and even shot at or spoken to people from Syria who were blindfolded and almost killed um, by, by Daesh before a ransom was paid and asked them, well, what is it about your faith that meant that you weren't willing to give it up against potential killing? Uh, and they've said that the joy they have in their faith interiorly and the, the dignity which it gives them is something that is just a prize too rich to, to, to dispense with. And... I think when all of us, when, when we're in, in times of enormous trial and tribulation, uh, these questions become very, very real to us, and our response to them becomes urgent. And, and I've seen that, I think, a little bit in these various travels that I've had. I mean, you're talking fascinatingly now about your experience working with persecuted Christians. So um, let's get down to how you got involved with this charity, Aid to the Church in Need. How did you come to work for it, and why... Do you work for it? I, I assume it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a, you're not making yourself rich doing this, I dare say. No, no. <laughs> um, I was a journalist working in a local newspaper in Kent and went to church one Sunday and heard an appeal uh, given by a member of Aid to the Church in Need and I just was, was fascinated in what the person from speaking for the lectern had to say. And um, so I, out of five years with this local newspaper down in Kent, having newly qualified, I thought, well, why not apply? See if they've got a post for available. And uh, it so happened that my predecessor was about to 
to leave and had already just handed in her notice. And the timing was right, it seemed. And that was 20 years ago. <laughs> so here we are, still, still at the crease, if you like. Let's, uh, let's talk about ACN then. Um, in my brief introduction, I said that you, you lend support, you support persecuted Christians around the world. How exactly do you, I mean, what is the nature of your work, really? The main objectives of Aid to the Church in Need are to raise awareness of where it is that Christians and others uh, who suffer persecution experience that hardship and, and pain. And secondly, it's to provide meaningful help. So in project terms, we operate in uh, nearly 140 countries around the world, and we provide uh, up to 5,000 projects every year. So a lot of these are what we call pastoral work. So it's repair of churches, providing what we call child's Bibles, um, training catechists, paying for the formation of priests and sisters, uh, and and supporting the media life of the church, so people the church church's message can be communicated, and that I've witnessed in many of the countries I've visited. But we also have the task of sharing the nature of that persecution, where it's happening, how it's happening, uh, who's affected, and why it should bother us here in the West. And that is the the, the key question for us. Yes, these people are suffering. What's it got to do with me? And the, the answer to that is that by the nature of our, our Christian baptism and the nature of our faith, we have a, a duty of care to others who also are, are believers. And also, um, because of our faith, we can understand more deeply their experience. We can connect because of that shared outlook that shared faith and what arises from that is that sense of solidarity it's us who are best able to relate to them and them who are best able to communicate the value of their faith at a time in the west where the value of faith is somehow seeping away as you said earlier and i think um so there's there's an exchange there that happens uh, uh, in many ways a rich exchange we give them help the help that they need, and they give us the means by which to reevaluate uh, this this key question of what what does our faith mean to us, and um, that I think is a critical part of the work of aid to the church in need uh, to help people value the faith that they have, which for you know for understandable reasons people feel doesn't connect with them so much, and but when you see what it is other people go through. Um, and the existential questions that that suffering poses in their lives, that makes us perhaps reconsider these questions for ourselves. Um, and it, it's very much a call of conscience. I think what stems from uh, the, the, the human situation very often is a sense, well, what, what is my purpose? Well, to help others. And the, this is a community that doesn't get the help that it, it really needs because religious people, as you said earlier, are frequently considered to be in the minority and of no particular concern. And it's because of that lack of con concern that here in this charity, we're able to reach out to the very, very people who need that help most. It's my impression that we haven't, as a nation, and the political class particularly, has shown very little solidarity with um, persecuted Christians across the world. It isn't something which our political leaders seem to be comfortable talking about, and you very rarely hear it. You very rarely um, hear the specifics of persecution um, of Christians. You often hear, of course, stories of uh, persecution. Um, often the facts are sort of obscured. I mean, we haven't been very good at it in this country, have we, at, at, at solidarity with, with Christians across the world? I'm afraid, in, in large part, that statement is true. And we, in Aid to the Church Need, in my role as Head of Press and Information, my role has been to reach out uh, to the media and 
we've spoken before about the challenges of, of getting that message across, that it doesn't fit with a, a, a very, if you like, pre-decided approach to this topic, which is to presume that the Christian is the oppressor, not the oppressed, that, that Christians have had uh, a favouritism shown to them which now needs to be rebalanced. And the, the, and the other side of it is that the nature of Christian persecution is actually quite nuanced. So we need to be quite clear about what it is we're saying. What we're saying is that, yes, Christians are indeed the most persecuted uh, faith group. But uh, what we're, specifically, what we mean by that is to say that Christians are persecuted or harassed in more countries than is the case with any other faith group. Other statistics, uh, other research has indicated that up to 75% of, of persecution is directed against Christians. But the challenge underlying all of this is that to do the research necessary to get a comprehensive, fully evidenced piece of data um, is very, very challenging. But So this means that you have to work off patchy data, but it clearly nonetheless shows the degree to which Christians are persecuted. But if you've got a, a mindset in the West, which is to presume uh, that Christians are shown favouritism, that they are the oppressor rather than the oppressed, it means you're not open to, to unpacking all of that. And it is a sociological study, so it's going to be complex. But the, char the, the task is before us as a as here in the West, to understand that, for example, in parts of the Middle East, including Palestine, Syria and Iraq, the birthplace of, of Christianity, uh, the church is at risk of disappearing within a generation. And if that shouldn't matter to us uh, as, uh, as a community, I don't know what should. As you say, we have spoken before about this, and the resistance that you have found in organisations like the BBC, for instance, uh, which has been reluctant often to take up the the causes and the stories that you bring to them. Um, I mean, is there any sign of that changing? I mean, do you think that is the uh, is that resistance are 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 hard hearts softening at all towards in this particular regard the the, the persecution of Christians? Are you making headway with the media? I'm not sure we necessarily are. Um though we need to keep trying. It doesn't help when the census figures that you mentioned earlier uh, point to a sharp decline in uh, people identifying as Christians. So the media will take that as being a, a signal to them that they don't need to give the representation uh, to, to Christianity uh, in the way that we might wish. Um, but I've seen no major breakthrough in terms of the media's approach to this topic. Um, but in the BBC and others, there are uh, a few individuals, journalists and others, who are really committed to, to enabling something of this to get through to the airwaves. But frequently, and this is a common theme, they will be forced to make a choice between either telling the story of Christian persecution or, in their mind, potentially inflaming, for example, Islamophobia. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a great shame that the, the suffering that a huge number of people are, are undergoing um, is, is silence because of, a, a, in some cases, a paranoia about uh, an action that is perceived as, as inflaming Islamophobia. It, it, it's surely critical that that news about how many ever many people were killed, for example, in atrocity in, in Nigeria uh, last summer, where 41 were, were killed in a church during a, a church service and 70 injured. Uh, and yet when the BBC and others come to cover it, their fear is that it will stoke Islamophobia. And why are you having to make that choice? Surely it happened. It's a, it's a fact. Just cover it. Are Islamists um, the worst persecutors of Christians? I mean, is it, is it in Islamic is it in majority Islamic countries, uh, Muslim countries, that persecution of Christians is worst? 
we can look to um, classic cases or countries where persecution is most severe to see that, um, yes, is, uh, Islamism, uh, Islamic extremism is the common denominator. So, you know, I've mentioned Nigeria. We can mention uh, a number of other countries across um, the Sahel region of Africa from uh, Nigeria over in the west right the way through to to uh, Sudan at the east and, and Mozambique down in the southeast. Islamism is the common threat. And, of course, we've seen in the last decade what it's done uh, in, in Iraq, Syria and elsewhere. So certainly uh, among the non-state actors, Islamist extremists are some of the most virulent uh, persecutors. Um, but they aren't always consistent, whereas the state oppressors, like North Korea, which uh, have this, you know, total enforcement, um, they have much more capacity to do long-term harm, although their hatred for Christianity may not may be just the same in terms of uh, strength as some of these extremists. Um, so, yes, and I've witnessed close up and personal the impact of of Islamist violence. I mean, fancy going into a church and seeing the head of a statue lopped off or bullet holes puncturing a, a, a crucifix um, and slogans written on walls of churches saying Christians should go to hell. Uh, to, to come face to face with that undiluted hatred it is, is, is very very uh, troubling and, and disturbing and, and that's why yes you can certainly say Islamist extremism is certainly one of the most virulent forms of, uh, of persecuting uh, agents at work in our world today uh, as it has been for some years gone by and it, the chances are it will increase over time not diminish why? Um, for the the, the reason is connected to uh, the breakdown of law and order in many of these countries, loss of jobs, loss of uh, habitat, uh, which means that um, Islamist um, groups are able to recruit militants because they've got no other hope in their lives. And uh, there's a lot of money being pumped in from oil-rich uh, uh, Islamic-leaning countries that, that fund and resource these things. Um, and the more that you see a breakdown of, of civil society in some of these countries, such as Nigeria, uh, but Mali, Mozambique, other countries, the more, uh, in a sense, uh, it becomes a lightning rod. Islamism becomes a lightning rod to, to, to disaffected youth and others who see nothing else by way of a uh, future. Just before we move on, I mean, are there any Christians, are there any Catholics in North Korea? We don't know uh, just how many Christians there may be. And it may be the case as well that um, many of them are in, uh, in camps. But certainly there are thousands of them, but how many thousands is a good question. You must have pondered this um, question, I'm sure, over the years. I mean, what is it? do you think, which lies at this hatred of Christianity as manifested by Islamist groups? I mean, why is the hatred there? What is it exactly that is, that is, that is causing that hatred to surface in these horrific ways? Two key points uh, come to mind in response. One, we have to be clear that the idea of God becoming man is not only alien, but at some level abhorrent in, in, uh, in the mindset of many uh, Muslim, certainly extremist groups. Uh, so they have a, a, a deep problem with that. And they also have a problem with the notion of, of God having died, Jesus having died on the cross. So when you see uh, the, 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 the most evident symbol of, of Christianity being the cross or the crucifix, that, that sets up Christianity a, a, as, a, as an obvious target for the very hardline Muslim, certainly the extremist Muslim. So there is a, a theological 
not only um, uh, dissonance, but a discord, a deeply rooted discord that is there. Although, of course, obviously at the same time, they recognise as, as uh, part of the Abrahamic tradition uh, the, the, what to their mind is the legitimate roots of Christianity. But um, there are certain elements of it that they find deeply abhorrent. So that has to be put on the table as a key area of concern. Um, and that would explain why when I was in, in, in Syria and Iraq and went to churches that were desecrated, so many crosses were, were damaged and, uh, and where you would find slogans saying, hate describing Christians and saying, we are haters of the cross, lovers of the cross, and that's why we don't like you. So there's that. The, the other element is that um, there is a, a strong sense within some Islamic cultures of deep antagonism to the, uh, the, the uh, legacy of colonialism. And uh, they, they see uh, Christianity as being, as it were, the, the sharp edge of, of, of the crusading drive. And as a result, when uh, they look at the, 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 the legacy of, of colonialism in many of the countries, their main focus is the Christians that were allowed to, were enabled in many cases, to flourish in, in many countries which were colonized. Although in many of these countries, of course, Christianity predates colonialism, it certainly flourished under, under colonialism. And uh, that then means that there's an association between colonialism and Christianity. And they see uh, the West today as being latter-day crusaders with unwanted influence in the, in the East and elsewhere. Uh, and and that that is seen to them as being a, a Christian, uh, a Christian mindset, and so the Christians that are, that are in these countries often very vulnerable, easy targets. They become pro proxy targets for the West. Have you, um, in your work, though, ever come across? Do any in the Muslim world? Do any of them reach out to you? Are there are there, you know, are there? Are there encouraging signs that, that some Muslims understand the need for peaceful coexistence? Do they encourage you at all? Are, they, are there any signs in the Muslim world, do you think, that things are changing for the better? There are very encouraging signs. There is, an, if you like, a, an increasing discord between uh, the moderate and the progressive Muslim and uh, the hardliner. Muslim. So um, when I was in Pakistan, we went to visit uh, a madrasa. And the idea, the very idea of a Christian group led by the bishop with his, with his sutan and all that, and a group of Westerners, British and Germans among them, coming to a madrasa, uh, shows that there is an appetite there for some kind of exchange understanding. And uh, in Egypt, I remember when we travelled around uh, and visited churches that had been attacked in the wake of the Arab Spring, uh, the, the church leaders would say, do you know the first people who came to, to extend a hand of sympathy and offer meaningful practical help were, were the Muslims? And they were ashamed uh, of Morsi and his regime. And they, in some cases, actually protected Christians from, from attack. So... We, the, 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 the narrative in, with regard to, to Islam is very, very nuanced and in some points deeply divided. Um, and there is, among many Muslim groups, a great appetite for at least understanding and cooperation, um, even if it wouldn't go, be, go so far as, as full-scale dialogue. Um, and we know that church leaders in Palestine and Pakistan and Egypt and many of the Muslim countries and in Nigeria, they've forged meaningfully deep uh, relationships with, with Muslim leaders in their own community. Uh, it's been incredibly helpful for their survival. I mean, that is very heartwarming to hear because we as Western Christians must guard against, mustn't we, the idea that, that um, the Islamic world is, um, un is uniformly hostile, violent, 
antagonistic towards us because um, because it is no part of Christian faith, surely, to 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 see ourselves at war with Islam. Absolutely, and um, we we see also the degree to which Islam is subjected to uh, the the impact of economic disadvantage, which means that the opportunities for education um, are often very, very varied. And, for example, I mean, Pakistan is a country I've got to know quite well. Where Islam is most problematic to, to Christianity is in the areas of the undeveloped, economically disadvantaged parts of the Punjab and elsewhere, where, as a result of that lack of education, there is... Um, a tendency in some cases to turn against the Christian and the, the, the moderate Muslims are by their nature the more educated ones. So um, we see there a, a great variety of, of mindsets and, and different approaches and um, it's clear as well that um, in many Muslim countries they've recognised that the violence and the, uh, the discord has damaged their economy, and so it's in the interests of the growth of the nation that, they, that this violence should cease, and that as a result, uh, some kind of accord or uh, a settlement, or, or at least a uh, some kind of coexistence uh, between Muslim and Christian groups is is essential for the for not only for the survival of the of the nation state, but also the growth. We were talking a moment ago about um, about the way in which we in this country and political leaders have not shown always the kind of solidarity with Christian brethren in other countries who have been persecuted. It's been, a, it's been very much a back burner issue. One man, though, who, who, who did um, use his position to, to, to highlight the issue was Prince Charles, when he was Prince Charles, now King Charles. I mean, he was somebody, wasn't he, who actually... Um, shone a light particularly on this issue. That must have been encouraging for you. Incredibly encouraging. And on those occasions when I personally have met the king, I've been uh, truly moved, truly moved by, by his compassion and his concern. And one thing that has struck me most about these encounters is his capacity to listen. We've introduced him to a number of survivors of persecution and... He he's simply willing to listen, to hear their stories and ask uh, searching questions that show not only a concern but also a, a deep knowledge of the topic. He he's remarkably well informed on uh, the, the 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 religious sort of geography of, of not only of of the UK but internationally as well. He he has clearly immersed himself in this topic and feels able to navigate his way through it. And um, for us, he has been a real uh, sign of hope that someone at that high level should take a, such a personal uh, interest. And you might argue, well, well, it doesn't do him much good to, to, to get involved in this topic. I mean, where's the diplomatic advantage and I'm sure that there will be a number of his advisers saying, oh, I would be, wouldn't go down that path too much. And yet he has done, and very consistently, for 10 years or more. And um, I, I think, as, as you say, it's been an incredible uh, sign of encouragement. And um, we hope very much that that, that that will continue. Although, of course, he signalled, didn't he, immediately um, after he became king, that his support for organisations and which he had as Prince of Wales would not be able to continue to the same degree. So we know that. Well, there clearly be other pressures on him now, but but the fact that he is standing there behind you um, and has has spoken openly about it um, is, you know, a very encouraging sign, isn't it? And I I I was very struck when he made this comment some years ago when he said. Um, so the the uh, on our coinage and on our notes it says fide defensor defender of the faith. But Charles said that he wanted to be seen as defender of faiths, 
um, a very sort of ecumenical approach to this. And, and actually, given the country that he is, he, is, uh, he is the monarch of, that's a necessary thing, I think, don't you? Absolutely. We need to find common cause in defence of, of religious freedom and increasingly in the West in defence of the idea of the importance, the value that faith plays in the public square. And th there's, a, a, there's a huge tendency uh, there to, to presume that you can just simply silence and ignore uh, those of, coming from a religious mindset. And by making a stand uh, for the value of faith generally, uh, he's doing an enormous service to, to provide some counterbalance to the prevailing uh, secularist, uh, woke uh, and deeply um, uh, unsympathetic agenda that we see in some parts of the media. And we've been talking about persecuted groups around the world, Christians. Um, of course, some of them are nearer to home. I was struck um, in one of your newsletters, recent newsletters, when it talked about Persecution of Catholics in Bosnia, actually. So that, you know, that's on Europe's doorstep. It's not something which is always happening on the other side of the globe. It's happening, you know, uh, just down the road, in a sense, isn't it? It is, and Pope Francis has spoken of what he terms polite persecution, whereby individuals and groups uh, are frozen out of the public square, uh, largely because of the faith that they hold, which is seen to be illogical, even uh, opposed to reason uh, and, and deeply prejudicial and, and opposed to, to popularly accepted values today. Uh, and so it, it's clear that a number of the, the, the conceptual situations that we find ourselves in terms of the, the public discourse are turning against Christianity uh, and indeed other faith uh, mindsets. Um, and that needs to be challenged. And... We, we have to, frankly, take the position that if we don't start challenging it now, we may soon find ourselves with fewer opportunities to do so. I've heard the argument made occasionally, you know, that uh, persecution, though terrible and never to be uh, wished for, of course, a persecuted church can find within itself... Um, a strength perhaps it didn't know it had. I mean, for instance, you think about what happened in Poland, where, you know, they had 50 years of a regime which was atheistic by design and intent, and the church was not welcomed, but that fact actually strengthened the faith, whereas we in this country, um, as Catholics, as Christians, um, as people of any faith group, actually can freely go about our business of worshipping in whatever way we can. But that, of course, can lead to a sort of complacency, can't it? And, uh, and we take very much for granted the fact that we're able to do this. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an easy life. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh, un unfortunately, um, we come from a, a, a culture which certainly, through the second half of the 20th century, uh, presumed that there would always be a, a platform of space uh, for 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 Christianity to put it put out its set out its stall to be part of the public square, and we now find ourselves in a very di very different situation, um, where on a, on a number of fronts, uh, the the Christian uh, approach is, is not welcome. I mean, have you seen that personally yourself? I mean, have you, how have you experienced that? I myself, I wouldn't say I've personally experienced it. Uh, it's certainly not through through my work, but you were aware of the, the issues to do the the pro life movement, um, the the issues to do with with gender and uh, sexual identity, um, that that the situation, the dial, if you like, has moved uh, to make it not only difficult to make the the, the counter position, but they're just not willing to listen. And I think that's deeply, deeply troubling. The work that you do at ACN costs money. I mean, how is is this uh, an issue which fundraising for which fundraising is is easy? I mean, how does the charity 
manage? Are you doing well in those regards? We do not have any government grants. We do not receive any any form of sort of state funding. Uh, we rely entirely on the generosity, the mercy even, of our benefactors. Uh, and, but we, the relationships that we forge with our benefactors is long and lasting. And this means that, that the donations are holding up extremely well. And indeed, there's been some growth. And we found this even during lockdown, that in actual fact, uh, at a time when people um, perhaps couldn't travel or whatever, they were willing to, to give what they had spare to, to charities such as ourselves. But I think that we have... There's a deep simpatico with our benefactors. The, 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 you know, we speak to them often, we email them frequently, uh, we hear from them, we obviously see them at our events, and we're very, very sensitive to, to, to their voice. And it's for that reason, for example, that we've, we've reached down far more towards an advocacy line, standing up, speaking up, articulating um, the cause of of persecuted Christians putting out our reports because we've sensed that our benefactors have have wanted that and um, and also getting people over uh, from countries of persecution. We had a sister who came several times from from Syria and who had been in Aleppo and helping the situation there. And the way people responded to her her testimony and coming from a position of faith as the driving force of her work was was just remarkable. Does this spring finally from your, from your own faith? Very much so. I think we, as Catholics, we um, are, are, are sort of the central point of our faith uh, is, is Christ's passion on the cross, his death, uh, his suffering, and that, that the way in which he offered himself for us um, is in a way replicated in the suffering that so many Christians undergo today. And uh, that shows how the relevance of, the, of Christ's giving of himself is still being, if you like, enfleshed, it's still being lived out today. And so there's a meeting point of, the, of faith in that encounter. John Pontifex, thank you. Thank you.